Well, hello and welcome back to your virtual tea time. My name is Tori. And today we have a really special episode. We have Missy Farke, head coach of the ASU women's golf team. And you're just recently inducted into the Arizona Golf of Golf Hall of Fame, right? 2022? Yes, yes. I don't feel that I'm that old to be in a Hall of Fame yet, but it was very, uh, very honored to be inducted into, I mean, this is my life. I'm born and raised in, in Phoenix in Arizona, and Arizona golf is in my blood. So it makes absolute special. sense. So congratulations on that. And I'm, I'm honored that you're here today. We have a lot to get into. We also have Tara Bateman joining us today. Hi, Tara. Hello, Tori. You have been really busy. Yeah. For so sure. <laughs> tell us, because I feel like, God, we, we started talking on the podcast almost two years ago, really, could be over two years ago. And we were talking about, you know, you used to caddy. It was, you know, an earlier chapter in your life, but yep. you've opened up that chapter again. I did. I did. So um, I went down to Florida, uh, Bradenton Country Club. Thanks for the yardage book previously. <laughs> <laughs> And I went and caddied for Brittany Linscombe. Um, her and I caddied. I caddied for her back in 2009 and helped her win her first major at the Craft Nabisco. So it was funny to be out there. There was lots of kids and caddies I do not know. There was still people out there that I was like, oh, wow, you're still out here. <laughs> um, and then it was fun to walk the bag and be inside the ropes again and just kind of see what what they do. The young kids coming up, man, I thought Brittany could hit it far these kids that we played with could smoke her on drives. I was like, you used to be the long ball hitter. She's like, kids, kids make me hit it shorter. I was like, I don't know. These girls can hit it far. Missy, you probably know you see it every day. <laughs> I see it every day. And what's next to come out on tour. And it's amazing. I mean, they are all athletes yeah. and everybody's training and everybody's doing everything they can possibly do. And the equipment, we spent a lot of time in equipment and the athletic component, the the strength and conditioning component, the recovery component, what I do now compared to what we even did 10 years ago and the things that I, equipment I travel with for rest and recovery. And, you know, we don't miss a date in the gym. My, my strength coach is level three TPI certified. And that's a big thing for me. I'm very, very into that. And I love the, the science of, uh, of what Dr. Rose and Dave Phillips have done and I believe in that strongly. And sometimes my my longest hitter might be the tiniest person on my team, yeah. which drives everybody <laughs> a little bit crazy, but she's a, she's smokes it. And uh, so it's a lot of fun to to watch that and to see because they are. I I know, you know, I, I have this great relationship with my alums on tour from ASU and you know, I they get their worlds get to intersect a fair amount. And, you know, they're like, you know, I'm training the one to come out and try to beat you. So it's uh, it's fascinating to to watch. And and it's really an exciting time for women's golf. Yeah, yeah. for sure. But, yeah, no, so kind of circle back. I, it was funny um, not being out there. There was people I didn't know. I got excited because we played one of our practice rounds with a girl that just came out of Baylor. Um, so I was like, I went to Baylor and played golf for <laughs> 95 years ago. Uh, <laughs> And then um, also one of the girls that we played with the first day, uh, she, she was a Xavier, Xavier grad. So I was like, you had Sister Lynn, you still have your uniform. I still have mine. Like, so it was funny just like how golf takes you, you know, I've been away from it for so long, but it can always find that connection with somebody that you you play with. So it was fun to play with a Baylor girl. Um, it was fun to play with a girl that had gone through Sister Lynn and, and off to college and now she's on the tour. So I don't know, crazy how worlds collide. Yeah. And let's get real. So we, Tara and I played a tournament together, a partner tournament together about one month ago, and she walked both rounds and she was telling me, you know, I got to prepare. I got to go. I got to carry the bag at the end of the month. And so that I've been fixated on that. Like, <laughs> how is she doing? How, how, how is her body doing when she's carrying the bag? Because yeah. that's a lot. So it was. Yeah. So how'd you feel? Overall, I felt okay. I was not as sore as I thought, but I think it helped. I played, we only played Monday. I got to ride in a cart, so I was a lazy caddy. Mm -hmm. Tuesday, we only played nine holes. Wednesday, we only played nine holes. So Thursday was the first 18 hole day. Brain to Country Club does not really have very many hills, thank goodness. No, it's flat as a pancake. Um, but my ankle held up the last two days. I wore my bigger ankle brace after, um, and then my back for the most part held up. Still going to go get some injections later this month again, but um, no, it's all good. It's funny. The biggest thing for me 
is I had the biggest bruise on my elbow and I was like, what is this from? And it's the metal where the metal connects to the strap on the bag. I kept hitting it. And I was like, wow, that's not where I thought I'd be the most injured was my elbow was like yellow for a couple of days. So, But yeah. did you love it again? Or I did. Like, did I you- did. Yeah. So I'm going to, I've told her I'll, I'll, I'll caddy for her out at Seville here in Phoenix, which is funny because when I Googled Seville, it said permanently closed, but I'm pretty sure Seville's open since yeah. they're going to host the LPGA tournament. Yeah. And then we'll see after that. So job market, I'm still trying to find a job, but if not, I'll caddy for her as long as I can. So she wants me to caddy all year. I'm like, I don't know, Britt, but yeah, uh, she's mean, a good girl. Um, we've both grown a lot. Uh, I felt like we meshed for the most part on the course. So uh, it was fun. So I appreciate the opportunity from her. Yeah, that is a lot of fun. And I like watching it along the way. So yeah, you'll continue to share your journey with us. Yep. Oh, so Missy. So many questions. So again, so I did not play a college sport. I barely went to college, so I don't have a lot of insight. So for me, I am asking questions that are just, you know, very might seem basic, but I just don't know what it's all about. So let's start with, well, why don't you give us a kind of a background of your career? Because you were a son, again, you were born and raised in Arizona. You were a sun devil and then you grew from assistant coach to head coach. So give us give us the rundown on. Well, I can tell you 100% coaching was never the plan. Never, never did I imagine that I was going to coach. It was just, uh, you know, and ironically, you look back, I look back now and I had two of the most iconic coaches in women's golf, Sister Lynn Windsor at Xavier College Prep and Linda Volstead at ASU. And so it, it makes a lot of sense now to everyone. But my journey uh, was to follow my sister on tour. And everything I did uh, from the time I was seven years old was to follow Heather. And Heather was quite a, a prodigy, was, I think, thir- won her first state title at 12, won her, uh, was played in the LPGA in Sun City at 13, and won her first USGA title at 16. And so my journey was to try to keep up. And mm-hmm. everybody in my world, it was like, when did you win your year's J title? And I was like, <laughs> I was like, I have a silver runner-up medal. Is that good enough? <laughs> and, um, you know, I grew up in this generation of wonderful of junior golfers in Phoenix that were, we were all different ages. We were all good friends. We all supported each other. Nobody belonged to a country club. We were a little bit of a, just a different group. And we started at Papago. And again, it was never, coaching was never the plan and just kept on following Heather, followed her to Xavier, followed her to ASU. And that was really what, what my goal was to just try to be, I was, uh, I was always just trying to keep up and be a part of the conversation and everything turned on a dime. And when Heather was diagnosed with cancer before my senior year at ASU, she was 24, I was 21 and life literally has never been the same since Mm. that exact moment. Mm. Then at that time, in school, trying to figure out my life, and then Heather's getting treatment in California at Cedar sinai and she I think she was treated in four different states. The, the treatment has come a long ways since then, and uh, it was very, very difficult, and uh, it was really cool that she got to be, was in between treatment and got to be with our team when we won our first national title in 1990. Uh, but still, not a, not. I was going to play. I was going. I kept trying to play. I turned pro. I did. What, I suffered through Q school, as I tell my players. You know, I was a tortured golf pro. And Heather's journey was just off and on, off and on, and really, really tough. And my heart just wasn't in it. So I got a job as a club pro out at Orange Tree, and I was I was an apprentice in the Southwest section, and so I've kind of been on all different sides of it, and then. You know, when when we lost Heather, we didn't touch our clubs for like a couple of years because it was the last place we wanted to be. Yeah. So we'd go, you know, shopping and and movies and things where we could where she would, you know, be safe from bacteria and germs because her blood counts were so low. And then I I got married and started a family and I really wasn't sure what I was gonna do. And then we lost Heather. And uh, it was just kind of, uh, we were all in survival mode for a while. Mm-hmm. And I worked at, 
at Camelback from my good pal Joe Shershinovich, who's the director of golf at Camelback. And uh, he said, come work for me. You got you to gotta start. You got to get back into golf. And so I did that, and it, I started playing again for fun. And, and then it kind of just led one thing to another. And, I mean, I was 35 before I started coaching. And at 30, I had my first diagnosis with breast cancer. And so it was all, you know, they watched me very closely, but it really, really never occurred to me that I was going to have to go through that. I was never scared of it. I just thought Heather's the one that had to do that. I don't know. We don't know why. I don't know why. And then I got just punched in the face with it. Mm. And that took a little while. And I had two children at that point. And I started playing again. And I started playing uh for fun and kind of got into why I really play golf, why I played as a kid. And I started to have some success again at the mid-amateur level. And I was good enough that I played in a USAM again in my early 30s and played in the pub links and became runner-up. And I was, I think, 32, 33. And everybody in the, I was in the semifinals and I don't think they were all teenagers in me. And so that was the big story in Chicago was... <laughs> The old lady who I laugh now because being an old lady at 32, 33, you know, I was the old chick, uh, you know, I can relate to what Tara was just saying because I was popping Advil every day. We played eight <laughs> rounds in, in seven days. And one of my teammates lives in Chicago and caddied for me. And we were like laughing. We'd laugh through the whole week. It was great. It was like, what, what am I doing here? What are we doing? And these college kids and all Americans and, you know, they're just grinding and I'm just ha having a good time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a breath away from a from a USJ title, but I lost on the. At least I took Candy Kang to the 18th hole. Nobody done done that all week. She was a, a star at USC at the time, and I really didn't know who was in college at the time or anything because I was just. You're separated. From I that. was separated from it, except for my buddies that were playing professionally, and uh, and Heather's friends that were still out on tour. And uh, the college game, I didn't really know a lot about. And so I really, I really, it was smart because I really didn't know. I knew where, what schools, what schools they were playing at, but I didn't know enough about their games. So like, I knew that they were quite good, but I was like, yeah, whatever, we'll just go play. And I kept surprising people because they couldn't, they couldn't believe that some old chick that hadn't played in a while, cancer, breast cancer survivor, that could even possibly be in the semifinals. And I just remember being on, I remember being on the first tee the la, the, for the final match and Candy Kong and this, who went on to be a very good tour player and her father's caddying. And let's just say he was very intense. And my buddy and I, Michelle Barron, uh, were just kind of chuckling. And the president, I think, of the USGA was the, our official, was our referee in the match. And the whole, like, they lined up the first tee, like, all the way down. And there's all these cameras and we're just looking like, what, what, like what, what is going on? What are we doing? So we just laughed our way through it, which probably really upset Candy Kung's father because, you know, that was my way to relax. And he was so, you know, intense that, mm -hmm. I mean, it almost made me laugh more because I thought I can't function like that. So it kind of put me back in a conversation of, oh, okay, she really did have game and, and life took its twists and turns. And I just, I played, I played a USAM again. I think it was, uh, I remember Lorena Choa being on the range and being like, oh, wow, this, okay, I, I know who that is. And, and so it was in Kansas and my dad caddied for me and it was a blast. So I got my juices going of what I missed and, and how much I love that. And I had always stayed really close to ASU and my alma mater and my coach. And so as an alum, I was very, I'm, I always knew the ASU players, and uh, and they had gone through that stretch of tremendous success, winning six in the 90s. So I, Coach V, had, you know, life has this twists and turns, and Linda had had a really bad golf cart accident, which really changed the, the trajectory of her career. So we, you know, tried to help her get through that. It was really tough, and it was a freak accident. And I realized at a point there was going to be a point that she was not going to be able to keep up. Mm -hmm. And the game was changing. You had to travel a lot to recruit. She was having trouble traveling. They were starting. And she had Ashley Adlita was a good, great assistant coach, but it was changing. And so she ended up retiring from coaching. And so that was the next big thing is like, who's going to be the next big, the next coach at Arizona State? 
And so they had a year, they brought the men's assistant over that uh, did not work well. And then they decided they were going to make another change at ASU and, you know, talk to me about, about the job. And I said, I said, well, I have two young kids and I'm really not, I'm not prepared to jump into this big job. I don't think I'm qualified for the job yet. And I said, but I'd be willing, depending upon who you hire as a head coach, I'd be willing to come in and talk about being the assistant coach, but I really don't want to travel full time all the time. I mean, so we were all these different things that were kind of swirling. And um, so they ended up going after and, and hiring Melissa McNamara Llewellyn, who was a good friend of mine from junior golf, who played the tour for a long time. And her mom was the uh, icon at Tulsa, Dale McNamara. And um, Melissa decided to take the job. And then she called me and she's like, do you want to be my assistant? And I was like, well, I don't, I don't know. Like, I don't know if I have time and I don't, I've kind of got this mom gig that I love and I'm kind of enjoying playing golf, but I really kind of needed to work again. So all these different things. And she's like, well, we'll make it work. We'll make it work with your family and you don't, we'll make it work. So I decided to take the job on and with the help of my parents being amazing and, and taking care, helping take care of my kids. And I was hooked pretty early on. I was, I was hooked pretty early on. And I was like, okay, I could have a great impact here. I might, you know, I mean, who knows where this will go. I'll be the assistant forever. Melissa's great. Melissa loves it. She was just getting married, didn't have kids. And we really kind of just fit. And so Melissa didn't know that no Phoenix with the, you know, I had grown up with all of the club pros and in the landscape and what golf was like in the, this community. Mm -hmm. And, and she was brand new to it. So I was able to, you know, everyone around here that's been, that's lived here at all, known me since I was, you know, eight years old, whether I like that or not, uh, it's a very small world. And so your reputation precedes you for better or worse. And so we just, we had a lot of fun. We laughed a lot and we walked into a team that was very divided and we both looked at each other like, what have we signed on for? What, what are we doing? And we were ranked, I think, like 50th at the time. And for both of us, because Melissa was a national champion at Tulsa, I was a national champion at ASU, and that was not okay for either of us. And we were like, okay, how are we going to do this? How are we going to pull this team up? How are we going to rebuild? And it was a huge job, but we took it on as a big challenge and with both of our personalities. And so we just dug in and started getting a lot of different, you know, I believe highly in mentors and I, we reached out and obviously we would talk to coach V and we would talk to Lynn and Pia, our great friends and mentors and Dr. Debbie Cruz and everybody. <laughs> how do we get, how do, first of all, how do we get this team from hating each other and how do we move them into a space and develop them to where we can, we can get them into a, you know, let's, let's crack the top 20. Yeah. And somehow we got them to the national championship, which was the top 24, and we shocked everybody because everybody's like, wait a minute. We thought ASU was over. We were happy to, you know, that we didn't have to compete against ASU. And we're like, no, 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 don't underestimate us. And from that moment on, we just went and took off. And I ended up having my, another baby, which I was not planning on. And my, my doctor at the time was like, I'm not sure I've ever had a post breast cancer pregnant patient, but we'll give this a go. <laughs> and so my wonderful third child, and we just have raised my kids being, I mean, they're massive sports fans, three sons. And, and we go, we still go to every football game that we're in town. I'm in town for, and every basketball game. And now we go to hockey games, which is our new love at ASU, which is phenomenal. And I'm like, that is the best ticket in town. I go to an ASU hockey game. That is so much fun. We have a new arena. And so we've just kind of immersed in this sports environment. And then it twists and turns. I really thought Melissa would never leave. I was, I always put my, my mentally, I was like, if it ever opens, you know, it's going to be mine, but I'm perfectly content in raising my kids and and that being my my first job, and Melissa would go off to Europe every summer with her husband and recruit, and I didn't have to do that, and I could be there most of the time for my kids. 
And then the job opened and Melissa decided to switch her life. And she and her husband went, moved to Auburn. And I was like, well, do I want this? Do I want this responsibility? And this, because Melissa and I had won conference championships together. We'd won a national champ. We put our, another national championship on the, on the wall together. I had gotten through another bout of breast cancer at that time mm -hmm. where I was in chemo for 18 months and that was a lot harder. And uh, chemo is a little bit of a different animal. So I decided to go for it with the support of my sons. And uh, I'm a single mom at that time and, and with the support of my parents. And then I'm just like, okay, let's figure it out. Because I've, I've always enjoyed it, the journey. And I often say to myself, I get way, paid way too much to do what I get to do. But it's a hard job. It's yeah. it's there's a saying about being a master of many things, master of nothing in but knowing a lot about a lot of things. I uh -huh. I, I have a, it's like being a GM and a mom and a triage nurse at times and where do we go with the I mean all these psychology Yeah, probably a therapist. Therapist and you know, at the same time and trying to help them live, live their dreams and then recruiting is an entirely different animal in the last five years than it's ever been before. So here I sit, and we pulled off another win that uh, no one was quite expecting. And I, Michelle Estel was my assistant for seven years, which was a lot of fun, and was a teammate at ASU. And um, and we've just kind of we kind I just sit back and go, wow, this is pretty cool. But I really feel like I still feel like a student. I still feel like the one the only thing that makes me feel like I've been reminds me that this is my twenty second year in coaching is that I look around and. My friends are all retiring, and my friends at ASU, my mentors that I look up to, and I'm like, wait a minute, I'm the oldest person in the room. What just happened? <laughs> so again, it's been a lot of twists and turns, and um, I said to my team recently, I said, if you have to ask if I'm competitive, then I'm not doing a good job, then you yeah. don't know me. Yeah. And yeah, so it's, I mean, I that's, a, that's it in a very long nutshell of how I got here, but it's not a... Like I said, it was not something I ever was like, oh, I want to be a coach one day and, and, dr and dreamed of it. So it was, it was something that I was very fortunate that right, right place at the right time mm -hmm. that it was meant to be. And it has been an amazing journey. Yeah. Well, it's an amazing story. I mean, and it's still going. So mm -hmm. it had to be told. Right, right. Yeah. I, I plan to be doing it as long as, um, you know, they are very uh, amazing Dr. Crow at Arizona State University and as long as they'll have me, I'll st I want to be there to continue to do some great things. Yeah. Well, before we get into more of the intricacies of being a coach and what it's all about, you brought up your competitiveness mm -hmm. and how you're still playing. Right. And when you, before we hit record today, we were talking about you competing and, and you had a, another bout of cancer right. recently, and it's just been tough to get back into the right. groove of playing. So tell right. me where you're at with your, just your golf game. I uh, decided it was one of my things. I, I think that competitiveness also helps with my health and that it gives me goals and gives me something to work towards. And so I decided that the U.S. Senior Women's Amateur was played last fall in, at Troon Country Club, and that was my big goal. And the timing of uh, colon cancer didn't quite coincide well with that. But mm -hmm. I thought, okay, maybe I, maybe I should start playing in some AGA events and things like that. So it was time to get my handicap back activated. And my youngest son is 20 and he is playing golf at Mesa Community College. And so, and he works at Papago. And so he's really the one that got me back playing again over COVID and during all this. And, you know, was would go home from the golf course to spend time with my kids. And my two older sons played football and basketball. They're much bigger than me. And uh, they're big guys. And my youngest was my golfer. And so for a Sunday afternoon, we'd go play, we'd go practice. And so he's like, okay, you need to get your handicap going again. And so this is how long it's been since my handicap was active. <laughs> I activated it and it was plus 2.3. And I was like, okay, well, that's not accurate. <laughs> 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 and uh, that is not accurate. And I need to, um, I need to start posting some scores to get that where it's even <laughs> remotely accurate. <laughs> And, and, uh, <laughs> is right. and, uh, so I've started, I haven't competed again, but that is my goal. That That's kind of what fuels me when I get upset with myself. And, and I threatened, we went and played on my birthday last August with my three sons and I threatened to quit after that. And they were like, Oh, come on. 
stop. And I'm like, oh, I am not, I'm having to coach myself because I'm, I'm angry and I'm doing everything that I coach my players not to do. And I've like, and so now my sons are coaching me like, okay, we've heard you say these things for all these years and you have got to I'm like, okay. So it requires a lot of, for me, because of, I mean, I've had probably 15 surgeries. So for me, really a lot of it is I've got to get stronger again and I've got to do a lot of mobility work and things like that. So when I do that and my oldest son ironically, is a trainer, is a sports uh, trainer and specializes in golf. And so he's learned when to push and when to back off a little bit because he'll be like, mom, have mm-hmm. you worked out this week? <laughs> and have you done, you know, and so I, so I'm being held accountable by my own children, which is quite my adult children, which is quite fascinating. That's such a loaded question. Like, um, have you worked out this week? <laughs> right. There's so much behind that question. Oh yeah. You right. Know? Right. And so it motivates me and and all these things and because because he's he knows the body in golf and when I can't move a certain way because of surge previous surgeries, he's he's like, "Okay, this is what you need to do. This is why when you're upset on the golf course, why you can't get to this position, this is why." And you know and Mom, <laughs> you know this. And I'm like, yes, yes, yes. So I'm definitely implementing more things and just when I'm on the road and stretching and things like when I go play golf, it's more important that I stretch for 20 minutes than it mm-hmm. is to hit balls. Like I can hit five balls. That's not really a big deal. But to warm up my body to get there. So so I, at least it gives me something like I, I need a carrot. I've just done that my whole life. I need something to... I actually probably need to get even get to the point where I pick a tournament that I want to play in and see. Cause, but somebody said to me when I was thinking about, I was trying to get to my, get myself to a place where I could at least end, qual, tr- play the qualifying for, for Troon. And they said, well, you know, you can't hide. I go, exactly. Can I play in a, can I play in a USA qualifier under a, under an assumed name? <laughs> so nobody knows that I'm out there and what I'm shooting and, because there's nothing worse than going and shooting 80 in my brain because competitively, because I'm just in my, my brain and my hands still think that I'm a plus two handicap. And I've got, you know, a lot of my friends, my age are, you know, they play in the senior tour and yeah. I'm good friends with Pat Hurst and we la- she's now, she's bored. So she's working for Titleist. So I just saw her last week in the road and we're laughing and, you know, we're all ta- Wendy Ward. We're all, everybody's like trying to, to like, in, I mean, especially someone like Pat Hurst and Wendy Ward and Solheim Cuppers. And I'm like, they feel exactly the same way I do yes. without the physical limitations. And they're like, oh, it's so, so upsetting and so annoying. And then you see some that have more time or different things they're doing to try to work on their game. And, you know, in the senior zone, you know, so at least we all can la- laugh and go, well, how many Advils did it take you to get through that round? And so I know that I'm not alone. I just have a little bit, few more layers in what I'm ha- trying to achieve, but it's a lot of fun and it does, it motivates me. And, you know, whenever I, whenever I hit balls on the range, I try to do it when nobody's around, especially not the guys. And, but my team sees that and they're like, all right, all right. So you're going to, you're going to play. I go, yeah, I'm trying, you know, so uh, so all that motivates me. I'm, yeah. I do well with motivation and something to, to play in, or even just going and playing with friends and getting invited to go play some great golf course. I'm go play Forest Highlands and in the summer, I'm like, okay, I want to enjoy that day. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to enjoy it if I'm not, I don't have to hit it perfect at all, but I certainly need to like get it out there a little bit. So, so again, because my, my brain is like that eight iron should go there and it's not, Yeah, (laughs) you know, so it's just a fascinating process, but it's a, it definitely makes it a lot of fun. I mean, it's all very relatable. I mean, at every level, you go into a competition, especially when you know there's going to be maybe some other people watching the scoreboard. The last thing you want to do is post a big number Mm -hmm. and have it out there for everyone to see. We can all relate to that. Right. No matter if if you're Missy Farke or if you're just uh, someone, some random person playing, that's the last thing you, but we can all relate to that. Yeah. So let's get into recruiting because you mentioned how it's changed. So Tara, what was your experience getting recruited? And then maybe you can let us know how it is now. <laughs> yeah, back in the mid-late 90s, uh, we're going back a few years. 
it was the Ping College Book. Do you remember? I don't oh, even yeah. know if they still have it. They don't have the book, but they have. I'm they sure it's have, online, it's online now, right? Yeah, it's all online. So you right. had to your, your local junior golf association would have it, or you could write into Ping, and they would send you this book, and it had every college coach and every college that offered golf, I think. And so I went through there and I was supposed to send videos. We were not tech savvy or didn't have a lot of videos and I didn't like any of the videos I had of myself. So I never sent a video into a coach and be like, here, look at my golf swing. Um, I played in Junior Golf Association of Arizona tournaments and then was told you should probably start playing in Arizona or AJGA, American Junior Golf Association tournaments to get some notoriety. Um, so I started playing in those, um, and then coaches would talk to my parents outside the ropes, you know, would she be interested? And then the recruiting door opened and coaches would call the house on a certain day or whatever, and you would talk and they would get to know you and, um, maybe do kind of an informal conversation at a tournament. I remember talking to a couple coaches at junior world. Do you remember um, what year you were in school when you were able to have those conversations? So I think I was ago, in, I can't remember. Real I think continue. it was between the summer between your junior and senior year because I was already signed by my senior year. Right. So I think it was a the summer between my sophomore and junior years when that recruiting door opened. And then you got so many. I think I got five visits uh, and then I had informal visits. Like I didn't waste a visit at ASU because I lived in town. So it was an informal and then went on, I did it dumbly and I did four weeks every weekend for four weeks in a row. I went on a recruiting visit and then I left the big one that I wanted to go to the most at the very end. And then I never went on it and I should have gone on it just to go, but it's okay. Um, I was I'm dying to know where that was. <laughs> uh, UNC. I want to go to Chapel Hill. Mm. I was a huge Jordan fan. I had gone to their golf camp and I had fallen in love with Baylor and um, it's funny because then I, my toughest decision was actually the day before signing day. Coach V called me and offered me some scholarship money and to come play for ASU. Um, and so I remember going to dinner with my parents and I had on a Baylor sweatshirt and ASU gym shorts on. And I'm like, I have no idea what commitment I'm going to do at this point. And I went with that I had already committed to Sylvia at Baylor. And that was kind of the decision. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to back out on her. So Glad I went where I went. Uh, sometimes I do regret not going to ASU, but I think uh, Baylor formed me into who I am today. I don't think I would have, I would my path would have been different, mm -hmm. um, different choices, whatever. But I still, it's funny. My parents went to ASU. My dad played on the golf team at ASU back in the day, and uh, I still carry an ASU golf backpack everywhere I go. And people are like, do you pay for ASU? I'm like, no. All I can say is I got a supply chain certification from there. So. <laughs> but uh, I'll support ASU except for when they're playing Baylor. So, <laughs> <laughs> so how has it changed, Missy, over the years? And, and what are you dealing with, you know, present day, this year in particular? What kind of things the, are going The NCAA on? has changed the rules several times since then. And one of the things they did, which... I think really hurts junior golfers that I'm not allowed to, to even speak to a junior golfer or they can't call me. It used to be able, they could call you anytime. You just couldn't call them. Well, that, mm. that stopped. You can't have any communication. All you can do is watch them. Mm. And even then you're limited. If you go in the winter time, so many evaluations and contacts. So after June 15th, after their sophomore year is when we can have our first conversations most of the top juniors will be committed by the fall of their junior year. And I'm already done with currently with 2025. I can start talking to the class of 2026 this June 15th. I have my list already in place and who I'm planning to contact in June. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I, my, my recruiting board shows 26, 27, and 28 which means I'm watching sophomores, freshmen, and eighth graders. Wow. And not everybody, I, there's a certain percentage of us that are at that space, and not everybody's at that space. And so I think that's kind of the, the hard part is that the timing of everything, the best way to do it is to not panic, you know, for junior golfers. And I think that's the hard, the hard part. And sometimes you feel... They feel they've got to say yes to their first offer because that, that offer might go away and... There's a lot of different things. And then there's the intersection with the transfer portal where 
I feel junior golfers feel that if it doesn't work out, I'll just transfer. And I don't think they understand how difficult that is to transfer to a different state, a different coach, different teammates. Now, a lot of people have done it and it and it seems to be working out. We'll see. I think we're so early in it that I think it's going to take a couple more years for people to finally, for these young women to say, I transferred, I played okay, but it was really hard. And I don't think I'd do it again. I think we're so early in it. And what happens with the transfer portal is that I often see, like, I, I can, there's so many great young women out there playing, but I can only have so many to issue. And I always say to young women, if they just want to walk on, like, go somewhere where you can play because you're not, one, you're not going to get better. The only way to get better is to compete. That's mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And men have to do that. There's because there's so many more young men playing that most men's golf teams have 10 or 12 guys on their team. And they also tend to, they can sort of pop at a different age when you have males versus females. Like these young, young women that they're really good at 13, 14, 15. And that's really, but then everybody, there's a, there's more range with young women and then with men and the men, like you just don't see anybody that's not already accomplished a certain amount really come into their stride their junior senior year. They are they're already where they probably need to be. And I feel that a lot of these young golfers are not really asking all the right questions in recruiting because every year now in the last couple of years, I'm always like, why did they chose that school? Why did they not choose us? I get I get turned down just mm -hmm. as much as anyone. And then I, I watch it play out and I'm like, that's, that's not the right school. And for different reasons, because again, if you're going to play at a top 25, really top 50 now school, golf is life yeah. and it needs to be your life and it, it needs to be your motivation. It's not about what your parents want, but yeah. what you want, because mm -hmm. you're the one that's got to be 20 hours is what we are allowed to mandate as coaches and if you want to, to be training in, to train it, right. Including, including team meetings, your practice, playing your workouts, all that 20 hours is all we get, which is nothing. That's coach and player together. Yeah. That's so, and we that have it, nothing. we have it all mandated. And so, I mean, in my day, did you have 20 hours? We had so many hours, uh, but I thought our workout was separate than our playing, but I know we practiced five days a week, about two hours. So that's, and then we had workout three times a week. So I don't, I don't know. There was some sort of hours that we could only do, but so kind of going backwards, what you're saying, like you have to live and eat and breathe golf. Like there's, you don't get an off season. You stop in November and you're back at the end of January. And basically you have time to do your finals and get your syllabuses for your next class. And you are back traveling and practicing and playing like right. that's something that was a big shock to me and like having athletes as friends are like don't you have an off season I was like no like the time you hit campus you're playing in your first tournament two weeks later right and then you go until basically Thanksgiving right before Thanksgiving I think we ended and then so you have Thanksgiving break finals you go home for Christmas you come back in January and we're starting practice in February 1st or you know or whatever right. it was so it's golf like a hundred percent of the time. Right. And right. it's your job. Like that was a big thing for my parents was like, you, you know, and student athletes and something I praise all the women's golf teams that I follow on Instagram or whatever, the athletes that play golf are intelligent. They are all on the, you know, rank some of the highest in all their schools for GPAs and stuff like that. And so you're not only dealing with, you know, golf, you're dealing with your academics and you're traveling, what, three, four day tournaments. I know when I did it, we had two day tournaments where it was 36, 18. So we could get more playing days in right. and you're traveling and I couldn't miss a class because most classes you could only miss 10 or 11 classes and right. then they automatically fail you. And right. we were always pushing that limit with right. leaving for golf. Right. It's definitely, there's some ups and downs. Like I think that there's a lot more you can do online now, which mm -hmm. is amazing that, but at the same time, there's a lot more you can do online, which means they, some, if you, if you have a test schedule and, and the, the window is open on Monday and we're playing on Monday and that test needs to be completed by midnight, you know, then they've got to 
get back after dinner and take the test. Whereas we never had to do that. I never had to do that. I never had to do that, no. And you'd come home and you'd catch up. And I think that's the thing is that you really have to look yourself in the mirror and say, this is what I want. I want to make my team better because I I tell my team this all the time. I'm like, I'm recruiting someone that's going to, going to try to bump you from your line, your spot in the lineup, Mm. because I'm always pushing you to get better because you say you want to play on tour. You say you want to do all this. You want to be an all American. You want to go play at Augusta national women's amateur. This is what it takes. There's no secret. There's no shortcut. It takes what it takes. It's my favorite Nick Saban quote. Yeah. It's in our locker room. It takes what it takes. Mm-hmm. And it might take somebody less. I mean, I love telling the story of my dear friend, Amy Fuerth, who uh, now works for the Arizona Golf Association. I'm going to call her out. She, We were together for four years at ASU. She was an All-American, two USGA titles, and um, I don't know how long she was on tour, 13, maybe 13 years. And, you know, Amy in college was... We didn't, at that time, Coach V didn't, there was no limit. And we practiced six days a week, period. Like that was not even up for discussion. And we had practiced every Saturday, Saturday morning, probably to keep us from going out on Friday night. Probably, (laughs) maybe. The 80s were fun. We had fun. Um, (laughs) That's a whole nother podcast. Um, So, you know, Amy would be like, you know, la, la, la. And I'm going to go take a nap or whatever. And I'd be like... I was the one that had to grind to ensure my third place on the team because I could, I didn't want to be left at home and I wanted to be with Amy on the road. And, and so I had to work harder to get to almost where she was at, but I mm-hmm. wasn't quite where she was at. And she learned on tour, she had to really work harder. She was very, yeah. she's very gifted. One of the best putters I've ever, ever seen. And she had to work a lot harder to do well on tour. But it takes what it takes. What it took for her to be successful in college was not what it took me. And I think that that's a really hard thing to learn. I think that junior golfers are not don't always have that space. Like we, we'd get dropped off and we get picked up at dark. Yeah. And or we, or then when we got old enough to drive, we we were. I was never home before dark mm-hmm. like ever. Mm-hmm. And so we always had somebody to, you, you've got to be comfortable being alone and you've got to be comfortable practicing on your own. And, but when you were lucky, you'd have somebody out there putting and chipping with you till dark. And that work ethic was just so instilled in me because I got to see what it took. And I watched I, nobody that, everyone that in my world, my teenage years in the Valley of the Sun, everybody worked really hard. And, you know, back before ASU, before eight, before Carson Golf Course, those were fields where everybody, you know, could shag balls. Man, you learn how to shag balls good when you're hitting wedges because the dispersion has to be tighter so it doesn't take so long to shag balls. Exactly, yeah. I'm not sure my kids even know what that means to shag balls. They'd be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you always had your shag bag in the trunk and then you're, you had to make sure you had a speaker in the trunk and then you would put your put your tunes on and then you'd come around the corner and hope somebody else was there and... You'd be, you know, you'd hit, you hit your shots out, you know, maybe 150 yards would be the most you'd go because you'd have to shag. And, and if you didn't have a range to hit, hit at, or something was going on and you just, it takes what it takes. And I think that that's a little bit of a space right now where when you get to, I always say this when in recruiting talks, but I've, we've been, I've done this for the um, junior golf association. How many of you do your own laundry at 16 and nobody raises their hands. Oh my God, none of my I kids did. do the laundry. Oh. I But that's because I won't let them. But that's important. <laughs> right. But yeah, that's important. Right, though. because they get, they, it is a skill that needs to be learned how how to do your laundry, how to how to feed yourself, how to get where you are on time. How to make appointments. How to how to make appointments, how to get yourself to the doctor, how to, t- how to tell your coach that you're not feeling well, and then how to, you know, all of these things. And I'm not saying that I don't have it, helped my, my sons through college and two of them already graduated from Arizona state. Very proud of that. But, and I still help them, but again, you've got to prepare them for success. Mm -hmm. And what we're, what we're trying to do to life as a professional golfer is hard Mm -hmm. and it looks very glamorous and it, and I have watched many friends and alums play on tour and be very successful and love what they do. But it requires something internally that you cannot get from anybody else. 
that no one can make you do it. And I think that's a, that's that space. And however you, if you're having to make, you know, make your kid play golf or practice, I said to my, my son, Cam, when he started playing golf, I said, I will support you and do anything I can for you, but I will not make you practice. I will not schedule lessons for you. I am not a swing coach. Our volunteer coach is my dear friend, Matt Trimble. And I, we, we, he and I have kind of worked out a good deal because I've said to him, I really try not to interject, but at the same time, he's, we've now gotten the space where he'll like, can I ask you a question as a coach? So I kind of put my coach hat on. I'm like, okay, my mom hat's on right now. Mm-hmm. You need to work on this or work on that or whether it's school or whatever. But we, So we kind of have this little this uh, coach conversation or not coach, and then he'll ask me about different things. And and it's worked out pretty good, but I am not his swing coach. And that's but it's been a very good, very good avenue for for the two of us for for success. But that internal motivation, I think, whether it's and and sometimes and you know, being a very proud Xavier grad and knowing Sister Lynn as well as I do, and you know, she's had she's had so many of her girls go on to play division one, division two, II, division three. To get it right is so smart to match the academics with are you okay practicing six days a week? Would you rather only be somewhere where you're going to play four days a week and they don't travel as much and you're not really highly encouraged to play all summer? And, you know, that's super important to find that fit. And I think it's probably the hardest thing for a junior golfer is to really look themselves in the mirror and figure out what they want. Yeah. What do they want? Because I can tell pretty quickly, and sometimes I always can't, I can't always in, in talking to a junior golfer, is this your dream or is this your, you know, your, your, your parents, dad's, your dad's yeah. dream? And when, you know, I'm always like, I want, I want those letters coming from you. I want, because I, I get a, obviously I encourage junior golfers to be writing coaches long before they are allowed to talk because that's how we get on, we get the on radar. radar. Yep. And I get hundreds of emails that mm-hmm. um, go through and and do your homework. And, you know, the net of schools that you're looking at, if you've got, you know, there's certain things you want to study or if you want to be a mechanical engineer or aerospace and, you know, Embry-Riddle has a golf team. You could be in aerospace and play golf yeah, and want to be a, a pilot or work for Northrop Grumman or, and here's the thing too, especially on the women's side is that, 99% of the young women that play for us do not understand what a gift it is to have golf in their world if and when they get out of out of playing mm. professionally. That ability that they could not play for five years and go out and shoot 75 and beat every, sorry, fellas, beat every guy they play with. They'll uh-huh. beat their boss. They'll beat- Out drive them too. They'll out drive them. They'll beat them. They'll take, you know, oh my gosh, I'm going to bring my ringer here. You understand how to live in the vernacular of golf, of yeah. at a private club, of you know, be a, a part program, of certain conversations, certain conversations that you know. And I, I think I read all the time about how many companies love to hire student athletes, mm-hmm. and because they are trained in a certain way, in order to be successful, you must be disciplined and dedicated and have great habits, because if you don't you're not going to last all four years. Yeah. And it just, and it has to come from it within. So all these things, you know, and from a recruiting standpoint that, you know, you get kind of deer in the headlight when you're look, you're talking to a 15 year old, 16 year old, and they're like, Ooh, that's a lot. And then some are like, you know, my sister at 13 knew she was going to play on tour. Yeah. yeah. And that's the one you're like, okay, that's, you know, I mean, my parents never had to make us go practice or you know, ever. And then again, I really just wanted to be where Heather was, where all the cool kids were. So I was like, okay, if I have to do that, I, I'll do that, yeah. you know, uh, just to be in the conversation. So let's say, let's put a player out there that you know would be a good fit on your team. Okay. You know that you want them on your team. What are you really competing with? What is it that other schools are offering or that you're competing with? Is it location? Is it facility? Is it academics? Do you guys have NIL too? It's it's a lot of those things. So and NIL, name, image, and likeness, has really changed athletics. And two, I believe it was about two years ago when it all started. And, you know, there was all this information and meetings and things. And I, I literally said, Oh, that's not gonna affect us. That's a football basketball thing. Mm-hmm. It's not, and it's really not gonna affect women's sports, let alone golf. And I 
am completely floored by how wrong I was. Hmm. It's absolutely in golf. It's absolutely in men's golf and women's golf. It's staggering what's happening. And to have that money, I mean, you can, if you're a, a local sports fan, you're listening to Coach Kenny Dillingham and Coach Bobby Hurley at ASU in football and basketball. I mean, Kenny, after the, the season ended, asked for $5 million in the next 10 days when their season ended in order to fill their team. So it's a whole, so, but the fact that it's filtered down to golf, it's stunning, but it is, it is, we're, we're in, there's no transparency. So I don't know what other schools are, like, I know if I'm recruiting against scholarship, scholarship, I know what that is, but I don't know what school B is offering this young lady against, and they're not necessarily going to tell me because they don't, you know, they're, so it's just a, it's this very strange time. How well, does, sorry. I just want to explain to the listener what NIL really is, because it's confusing to me. So can you guys explain it to the listener on what name in, image likeness is and how that affects the athlete and what they're able to do now? Missy probably knows more than me, but like, you know, just the, a college, a booster can give, say, I want to give Missy a hundred thousand dollars, come to ASU and play, you know, like a 16 year old kid getting a hundred grand, or maybe it's more like 200. I don't know what they do in women's golf, but you know, the, they just showed a picture on Instagram of the quarterback for Georgia buying a $460,000 Lamborghini. Oh. So, you know, uh, that's from NIL money. So, you know, I have a eight year old, he's eight today. Happy birthday, buddy. You know, he wants a Lambo, but he's seeing all this on Instagram or TikTok and whatever. And he's a good athlete. And for me to even be like, you have to continue to work hard to even think that you're getting this, but that top 1% of these college athletes are getting it. And now it's becoming 2%, 3%. And you watched, you know, University of Washington's whole football team get dispersed. Alabama's whole t football team's getting dispersed. Um, and it's all for booster money and companies, you know, BYU does it good. I think if you sponsor one, you have to sponsor the whole team. Mm -hmm. So like, I don't know, it's some um, nature Valley granola. I, I don't think it's them, but it's some granola bar sponsors like the BYU football team. So they all get it. So, so technically it's, an athlete, a student athlete is supposed to be compensated for their name, image, or likeness, where they are taking a picture with a... ASU shirt on. <laughs> right, or a, a truck. Yeah. And it's supposed to be outside of the athletic department. And the, there's all these collectives, and that's very complicated that I don't even understand that fully. Um, but they... So... Uh, this dealership is going to give this student athlete a car. So this student athlete posts on Instagram. And so that, so it's a business transaction. Mm. So it's not supposed to come from the university as coaches. The, the rules are, we are not supposed to talk to our athletes about it at all. It's supposed to have like, it's not supposed to happen. It It is happening. And it's, Again, it's the wild, wild west. So everybody's just trying to figure out how to navigate it. And because there's zero transparency, at least professionally, you have a salary cap, mm -hmm. you know? So now we have, we don't have a salary cap and you don't, it's which school has the most money because they want wins. So they're going to, they're going to invest in women's volleyball. They're going to invest in women's basketball. They're going to invest in women's golf. And they're going to say, okay, we're going to make sure that women's golf has a hundred thousand dollars this year to spread out as they wish to. So then, you know, then we'll make sure that that happens. And then that athlete before they sign, they know that. And it's so brand new and it's so undocumented that in our sport that we're literally just trying to figure out what's happening. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Rosang on, on the women's side killed it. And made did a great job, and I am a huge Rosang fan. She's a lovely young lady. I'm so excited for her on tour, even though she helped her team beat up on us a little bit <laughs> and the rest of the country. But she's she's fantastic, and I'm so excited that that. And this is a whole other subject. I'm really glad Rose went to school for two years mm. because it wasn't about wasn't the fact that she wasn't ready to play golf at 18. She had an opportunity to grow up a little bit for two years and be on her own and be around a team and figure out how to how to grow up a little bit and 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 all those things and learn how to do interviews and and make mistakes and 
not do it out in front of the public eye. And and some of the LPGA players that didn't have that up, did, t- didn't take the opportunity. They all had an opportunity, didn't take it for whatever reason. So I think Rose is a great example of that. And because she is such a lovely person, she she did really well mm-hmm. and set herself up in a you know in a great space. She's a bit of a unicorn. I will say that I have recruited against athletes that I think were given NIL money. And again, that nobody's no, it's it's a it's so secretive, yeah. right? And so you can't. It's how it, do you? I don't know. I don't know. I don't have the answers. Like this is probably a whole different topic or, or, or podcast, but. How does the USGA determine, you know, when IL NIL money is crossing the line of amateur and pro? I'm just, I'm just saying, right? Yeah. Well, no, when I was a the, when I was a junior, we couldn't even get we couldn't get clubs from, you know, when I went to school, like I said, 25 years ago, the university got the clubs, we didn't get the clubs. Right. Right. And well, now, now it's now a little bit different, see, right? Now you see all of my colleagues and friends in the with work for the equipment companies, they are all in an arms race. And I, I watched Ludwig Eber play at our men's event last year and just watching that their Everybody, recruiting yeah. space of, I don't want to get it wrong, but whatever company he he is with, there were a couple of other companies circling. And I had somebody say to me, Go, watch what's happening on the tee box over there. And 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 what I wanted to watch Ludwig swing because yeah. he's got a gorgeous swing and he's super, super sweet. But there were four different equipment companies in college, watching him play a college tournament, circling to make so try to like you know from a recruiting standpoint of don't t- don't talk to my guy, that's my guy. We're you know that's my guy, and you know and again that's that's at a high high level, but that's where it's at. And so you know from a an NIL perspective, that is one thing about it is that I've I've said this before. Club companies will only give money NIL money to players that they feel are at the top of their list. So they are invested in players that they think are the next tour players and are great representatives of their company. And, um, you know, Ping does that. We're, we're Ping, I'm a Ping ambassador and they do a great job with that as well. And, and, but in, but in NIL, it doesn't always at the top, top, your top quarterbacks, things like that. But again, you've got schools that have more money. And a lot of them that have the football money, they have in their collective millions and millions of dollars that they can spread to every sport because as an athletic department, they want to be ticking all those boxes. And so they're able to do that. And we're not, we're not quite at that space yet. Really, the, the Pac-12 in general has not done a lot of that. Rest uh, in peace. It's, <laughs> no. Isn't that crazy? Knife, you in say, the, knife in the heart is a Pac-12 athlete. You coach. say football money. Is it is football making all the money? For football all? and basketball are usually the money makers tend tend to be, and then every other sport's kind of whatever. and all that money just gets sprinkled down to the yeah, other sports. It's the TV money, and that's really where that's where we we lost the conference was in TV money because. The thing is when I, this is the one thing I, when people say to me, well, it's all about money. And I've said, yes, it is all about money. It has to be all about money because my sport doesn't exist without football and basketball. Mm. Uh, Olympic sports, which thankfully finally (laughs) golf is a true (laughs) Olympic sport. Yes. You know, we don't exist. You know, none of the, none of these, none of those sports, we don't, we're a non-rev sport. And I tell my team this, I said, I said, we exist because of football and how hard those guys work. So really, it's my understanding that the whole reason why we're in the situation we're in with the conferences is the TV rights, the TV rights to football. And in certain conferences, they're in smaller markets. I mean, we're in a big market here in Phoenix where we have every professional sport possible and, you know, these uh, schools, they are the only gig in town. They are the gig where 100,000 people spend the whole day to drive three hours to go watch their team play football. Mm-hmm. And, and, that's, and, and that's a wonderful thing to have. How do we keep from cutting sports? How do we keep from, how do we keep as many Olympic sports competing? Because we want more student athletes. We want opportunities for young men and women. And, you know, Arizona State is 26 sports. And that, that budget that line item is massive. I bet. And, and how do you and how do you do that? And how do you sustain that? And so I think that's the space that we're in when someone kind of offhandedly says it's all about money. And I said, yes, it is all about money. 
And it's about, you know, most people in athletics understand they, they're passionate about it because of all of this, these uh, Olympic sports and all these thousands of student athletes in non-rev sports. And how do we keep them in that space? Yeah. <laughs> uh, this has become a recruiting show and I'm okay with it because I'm finding this fascinating. We have to wrap things up, but I know we kind of touched on it earlier, but I have heard another hot topic button word of transfer portal. And that seems like it's in the same space as the NIL where it's so new and they're kind of figuring out how this is going to serve. But I've heard some horror stories about the transfer portal too. So can you explain to the listener what the transfer portal is and, and why I keep hearing about it too? Because is it I like don't, a I mess don't, in football also? I don't, football I don't know what yeah. the exact Basketball. genesis of, of the transfer portal, what, what, where it all got started. Probably to give the student athlete the opportunity to not, it, it used to be very hard to transfer. And you had to have permission and you couldn't talk to another, if Tara's playing for Baylor and I'm a coach, I'm a ASU coach. And I start talking to her about, you know, you really, are you really happy at Baylor? You should, you should, you know, we got, I got, a, I got a spot next year. Illegal, very illegal. Uh -huh. And uh, still illegal, by the way. And now it's called tampering. And now you can put yourself in the transfer portal. You don't need anybody's permission you can do that, and then you can you can see what's out there. Uh, what's happening is the tampering part of the transfer portal is that our coaches talking to in every sport, our coaches talking to a student athlete on another team because they have room, they have a spot, they're not happy with their lineup, their or, yeah. right, whatever whatever space that is, and then NAL kind of comes back behind that, like. You know, so a coach is looking for a, a, a transfer, but I, I still can't. Once in the transfer portal, I can talk to them. But before that, I can't talk to them. And so our date is coming up for, there's two open windows for women's golf. The next one's coming up in, I think it's a week after the regionals are decided. And it comes right around May 1st. And I promise you, Every, including me, will just be looking. Although I don't have, I've never had any, I've had one person transfer. And that's because she, uh, I didn't have, she was a gra she grad graduated in, in four years and had a COVID year, which is a whole other story, which is, this is the last year for the COVID year. So she wanted to work on her master's and play a, f play a fifth year. And I didn't have any money. So she ended up transferring somewhere where she could get, Get a year of, has a year of eligibility. She's playing and getting her master's, which is awesome. So mm -hmm. she's she's a, a sun devil through and through. Yeah. So I have, haven't had anybody leave, and I haven't had anybody come in. So I'm really a little bit unusual in that space because that's not there's not many teams that that's the case. It used to be, you know, why are they all transferring? That it's usually a red a red flag, and it still can be a red flag. Because another thing I've like I look at a recruit, like you should be asking me, have, do I have any? Who's transferred and why? Because to me, that's not a good sign. Yeah. And but now it's become so normalized that it's like, oh well, they've had two transfers and then they have, so they they're looking for somebody better because you can't uh, remove somebody from your team based upon their play, which is to protect the student athlete. Absolutely, it's a great rule. And it used to be you wouldn't want somebody transferring in because you'd say, what's what's wrong? Why, you know, because the grass is not always greener like everybody thinks it is. And it's still not even in this case scenario, in this scenario. So it's made it very easy to transfer, very easy. I think, for example, our men's basketball team, this year's team has three returners in their entire roster. And what, maybe 15 to 18 guys they have on a basketball team? Yeah, transfers also got different in big sports like that. Because when you transferred before, you had to sit out a year. Um, and now you don't have to sit out a year. So I think there's like a couple things with that transfer portal. I don't know all the rules or ins and outs, but you don't see them sitting out anymore when they transfer from right. one to another. You have the COVID years, which, you know, you have older in which you sort of touch on that. And I'm, I hate that kids had to go through it, but I'm glad that we're over it and we're back to normalizing the four years for everybody. Cause I don't think it's fair to some people that, you know, I don't know. That, that's a whole different topic. It, it really hurt recruiting. Yeah. And, and so does the transfer portal because now if you have an opportunity, if you have a slot you need to fill and for whatever reason that that person's not happy, but they're, they're playing really good. You have a body of work that 
you know where they, you know that golf course, you know it, it has more meaning, their results in college than it does even in junior golf. Because in junior golf, you're always having, trying to figure out what those scores really mean. Mm -hmm. They won this tournament, but was anybody there? How easy was the course? Was it 5,800 yards? We play 6,500 yards. And so I'm sure they can do that in every sport like we do. Like I tell junior golfers that what they're, which is, which is what's kind of, I think another thing for hard for them to understand in, in this is in my brain. And I've, I have a lot of, a lot of coaches won't say this out loud, but that's typically what they're doing is that if somebody has a 75 scoring average, I will add two to three shots to put that into their college to our schedule to relate that to where they would be against our team. And mm -hmm. that's because of all those factors. And then they also think that it's, that their scoring average will continue going down at a certain pace and you don't, it's hard to recruit potential. And so you, you need to recruit. There's a lot of intangibles in recruiting, but the, the tangibles you have to put a, you have to quantify that as best you can. So that means in order to be beating my third player, I'm looking for whose scoring average I think is 73.6, that they're, I'm looking for somebody that in junior golf is shooting 69.70 on average in tournament play. Wow. Yeah, so, yeah and you have different conditions because we always noticed – you know, like but the Big 12, we played our Big 12 championship in like 45 mile an hour wins. And then we're right. like, it, the Pac-12 plays their Big 12 championships or their Pac-12 championships like in the sun. And, you know, I'm not saying you guys don't ever, ever have diverse weather, but like the Midwest in the spring is a little different than the Midwest here, unless you look out today and it's Well, raining. now they have a, they, the big, <laughs> as I'm entering into the Big 12, they have neutral sites. Yeah. So to try to stay warmer, just to, to not have that happen. Yeah. yeah. So there's yeah, just different climates of what you're playing. And I remember as a recruit, I had never played in the rain. When it rains here, right? It's thunder and lightning. What's, you get a, off rain, the what's a rain suit? Yeah, it's yeah. a rain suit. Um, so I remember that was very interesting in Delaware. You know, the, what was it? The McDonald's championship, the AJGA out at uh, Wilmington Country Club in Delaware. It was just torrential downpours, and I was like, uh. Right. <laughs> this right. isn't fun. Right. Yeah. Why? Are, is it getting rained out today? Yeah. Are we going to delay it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but no, I think, uh, Missy, you've done a great job. The girls always seem happy. It's watching your guys' Instagram. The girls come back. You know, um, I know a handful of them. They always talk very highly of you. So, Well, thank you. Yeah. I, I appreciate that. There, I, I always tell them, I, when I, from the recruiting process to past, I'm like, I'm not joking. When I say, I'm always here for you when we're family, and you're probably not going to be able to get rid of me. And my players see that and know that that's authentic. And, you know, I, I have my daughters at work and my son's at home, so <laughs> yeah. it's been a pretty good gig for me. When I need girl time, I go hang out with, you know, my team or my alums, and and that's really quite special. And, yeah. and uh, I, I, I'm very, very blessed to get to do what I do. Yeah. And, Missy, we covered probably about – 3% of what I wanted to talk about. So I know you're going in season soon, but let's get you back on. I would love we'll go to. Even, I mean, this was a recruiting show, but I didn't mind it. But there's just so much more to Absolutely. what you do. Absolutely. So, so, so much more. And you're just such an inspiration. Well, thank so, you. Thank you so much for being on. Tara, thanks for yep. coming back. No worries. You will be back on <laughs> soon. And we'll figure out another time. My for pleasure. It's a lot by. of fun. Thanks, Missy. Thanks. Thanks.